So when I was a, when I was a kid, one of my favorite games to play was dominoes. Uh, and to be clear, I don't actually know how to play dominoes. Um, something with the dots, I think, and the numbers, the core, I don't know. But uh, I do uh, know how to do what? Uh, when I say play dominoes, I mean line them up in a line and then press one, let them all knock over, right? It's, it's one of those incredibly satisfying things and maybe you've seen a video going around online of hundreds or thousands of dominoes you know, set up and all you have to do is just knock one over and then all the rest of them fall. And in doing that, you're, 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 uh, you're initiating what's known as a chain reaction, right? So you are starting, the first domino is uh, knocking everything else over because you've initiated a chain reaction. And uh, I just thought of a, 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 just a thought question this week I had was, uh, how do you stop a domino effect once the dominoes are already set up? You remove a domino from the middle of the pack. So when you do that, you're not going to change anything that happens uh, prior to the domino you moved, uh, but you will change everything that happens after that. You just have to actually take the initial step to move a domino. Now, I don't know if you know this, but uh, we are actually living in the midst of a massive domino effect. Uh, and I'm not talking about a, a game. Um, I'm talking about us living within a reality where it feels like because of everything that is happening around us, uh, we are forced because of the dominoes that are falling our way to live a particular way. We are forced to react in a particular way, respond in a particular way because of what is happening around us, everything that has come before us. And again, I'm not talking about just simply a, a game. I'm talking about living in a reality where we feel pushed and pulled in a particular direction based upon factors that are outside of us. I'm not talking about dominoes on a table. The domino effect that I'm talking about is the division that we see in our politics. And you see, there's a lot of dominoes that are leading their way towards us but all of those dominoes, they start with the first one, the one that sets everything over. And that first domino are the questions that we have about politics. Because especially if you're a Christian in the room this morning, you have a lot of political questions. Like how does God relate to the government? And how does God relate to Congress and the Supreme Court and to legislators and lobbyists and politicians and presidents? And how do we relate to the government and those that govern us? Should we submit to the government? Should we challenge the government? Should we do both? When do we know when to do one and not the other? And what if we don't agree with our government? What if we're persecuted by our government? Can we disobey our government? Can we defy our government? Should we ever work in government? And what about the laws that our government uh, passes? How do they relate to God's laws? Should all sin be a crime? And if, if not, then what sin should be a crime? Uh, are, are we a Christian nation? Should we be a Christian nation? Has there ever been a Christian nation? Is there such a thing as a Christian nation? And how about specific issues, right? Do Christians side more with the Republican Party or the Democratic Party? If Jesus was voting this November, who would he elect as president? Should Christians own guns? Should Christians call for more taxation, less taxations? And what about immigration or, or the environment? Are Christians pro-fracking? Are they anti-fracking? Guys, what even is fracking? What is it? <laughs> now, I, I know what you're thinking like, wow, how is he gonna answer all those questions this morning? I have good news for me. I'm not I'm going to, <laughs> I'm not. Because those are just the first, that, that, that's just the first block. And then you add in the 24-hour news cycle that's built to get us to hate one another and social media posts and awkward family dinners and water cooler conversations and passive aggressive comments from those that we interact with. And then it feels like when we're stuck here, the dominoes are falling. And there's only one way that we can respond. You know, we've been in this series we started last week called Ambassadors representing a misrepresented Jesus. And we said last week that something that is misrepresented becomes something that is misunderstood. And we think there is nothing and no one more misunderstood in our world than Jesus. But the problem is if he's misunderstood in our world is because he's been misrepresented. And the sobering reality we walked through last week is that we are the ones at fault when that happens, followers of Jesus, because it is our task to represent Jesus on this earth as his ambassadors. 
There's a lot of arenas that we represent him in. We represent him in our homes, in our, in our workplaces, just in everyday life. But specific to today, we represent him in our politics. And I think that when it comes to misrepresenting Jesus and misunderstanding Jesus, we don't have to look any further than the American political landscape. Because like I said, it can often feel as though other than represent Jesus, we are forced to fall in line with the reactions and the hostility and the division that is around us, right? Like I must be demeaning to you because you and I have different political ideologies. I must poke fun at you because you're a part of an opposing political party or you voted for that candidate. I must write you off as a friend or a family member because of your stance on this issue or that. I must question your salvation because you voted differently than me and you claim to be a Christian. And, and here we are, it's 2024, it's an election year, and the dominoes are already falling all around us. And as this year progresses, we are going to get more hostile, more angry, more divided, and that division is going to lead to angry posts on Facebook and Instagram and friendships that will probably end, really awkward Thanksgivings, and even churches that will split. My question for us today, though, is what are we going to do about that? Because here's what I want us to understand this morning. Disagreement is inevitable. But division's a choice. You will have people that you disagree with, but you have a choice whether you will divide yourself from them. And so that is what this morning is all about. Are we going to be willing to be the ones that will remove ourselves from the political dominoes that are falling all around us in an attempt to represent Jesus accurately in our political Interactions. What does that even look like, Chris? Does it mean that I'm just not going to vote this year or I'm just going to put my head in the sand and never discuss controversial things with friends? Does it mean I'm going to ignore reality? Does it mean that I'm just going to be overly optimistic? This morning is all about practically how we can step out to represent Jesus. So before I tell you what I'm going to do, I want to tell you what I'm not going to be doing this morning. I'm not going to be telling you who you should and should not vote for. I'm not going to be answering every political question we have about every single issue that will arise this election season. And I'm not even going to be offering my own political leanings. I just want to provide us with two things from Scripture that I believe that we can hold on to as a church as we enter into and continue on in a year where we can represent Jesus well in politics. Here's the two things that I wanna give you this morning. The first one is I wanna give you a place for politics. The second one is I wanna give you a paradigm for politics. A place for it, where does it belong? What's a theology of politics and government? And then second, in light of that, what would that mean for me if I want to represent Jesus well in my political interactions? So first thing, a place for politics. In order to understand how we can represent Jesus in politics, I think we need to first obviously understand a place for politics uh, when it comes to a Christian worldview. And, and political questions, they're not a 21st century Western American thing. Christians in every single century have asked political questions. And, and that was especially true in the first century, which is when the New Testament is being written. And see, when this letter we're going to read today to the Romans is written, um, we are reading something that was written to a church located in Rome. Now, the Roman government or the Roman Empire, it, at this time, it ruled most of the Western world. So basically everything from Spain to Turkey was under Roman jurisdiction. And, and the power of the Roman government, it was felt everywhere in their empire, but it was obviously felt most in the capital city of Rome. That's where the Roman Senate was located, which was the ruling governing body of Rome. And that's where the Roman Caesar resided, who was the leader, the emperor of Rome. And so um, it, it was considered not just to be the epicenter of Roman politics, but really the epicenter of worldwide politics in this culture. And there's a church that forms there. 
And this church is learning how to follow Jesus. They're learning how to live with one another. And in the midst of this, Paul writes them a letter. And in this letter, he says this in Romans chapter 13, starting in verse one, he says this, let everyone submit to the governing authorities since there is no authority except from God and the authorities that are instituted exist by God. And so then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command. Those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves for rulers are not a tear to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the one in authority? Do what is good and you'll have its approval for it is God's servant for your good. But if you are do wrong, be afraid because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. Now, we've said this often here, but remember, the Bible was written for you, but it was not written to you. So if you want to know what it means for you, we need to understand what it meant to them. So what did this mean to the church in Rome in the first century? A little bit of context will do us well here. So but prior to Paul writing his letter, there was an emperor in Rome named Claudius. And because of a dispute he was having with Christians, he actually passed an edict that banned anybody who was Jewish from living in the city of Rome. Now, a church had already started in Rome. There were Jews in that church, Gentiles or non-Jews in that church. And then all of a sudden, Jews are forced to leave Rome. <clears throat> now, why is that important? It's important because when they are told to leave Rome, you now have a church in Rome that is only full of Gentiles. They have different worldviews walking into this relationship with Jesus, different mindsets. And so when this edict is lifted a few years later and Jews return back to their uh, home, their city and their church, they walk back into a church that looks very different than when they left. Maybe you've experienced this. If you've moved away from somewhere and come back to visit a church you grew up in, it's probably going to look very different than when you were there before. Now, this one looks different because it no longer has Jews that are a part of the church, or they weren't at least for a time period. And so they had to figure out how to <clears throat> live in light of that reality. And then now they have come back. And you've got to imagine, you've got some people in this church that have differing perspectives on the government. One group just got told by the government, leave, you can't be here. The other group got told, hey, you're fine to stay here. There's probably a little bit of animosity, some disagreement. Well, maybe you're too close to the government. Maybe you're too anti-government, whatever it might be. I'm, I'm just telling you this to make one point. Uh, we, we are not reading today some philosopher in an ivory tower by himself pontificating about government and politics. It's not what we're reading here. We're reading about a pastor who loves these people and wants to give them real life practical theology when it comes to politics. And I think that's what we really need even today. Not just some philosophy. Like we, we just, we need to have honest conversations about the intersection between our theology and politics. And so we read those five verses, Paul's outlining what this looks like. I want to give you one statement to summarize everything he has said. His theology and what I think is an accurate Christian theology of politics, and it's this, that Jesus places every government in every location in every time period to do two things, punish evil and promote justice. Why does government exist? It exists because Jesus institutes it in every time period, in every location, to promote evil or promote justice and to punish evil. Don't want them to promote evil. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so here's what I want to, I want to break this sentence down. Okay, let's take that first part. Jesus places every government in every location in every time period. Look back at verse one. Look what it says. Everyone submit to the governing authorities because they exist because they are what? They are instituted by God, which means they are placed there by God. Look again at verse four. Government is God's servant for your good. Later on, it says it is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on those who do wrong. So throughout these verses, Paul is making the point that governments exist because Jesus has placed them there. He is sovereign over everything. He is the supreme creator who has authority over all. He is the judge to whom all will give an account. He is the savior who desires redemption of all people. And he is the king to whom all glory belongs. The world does function within a government. It's a monarchy and Jesus is king. 
And he has authority. And the biblical pattern of God is that he bestows and gives his authority to his image bearers, which are you and me, to human beings, to bear his authority on this earth so that we can have dominion over his creation to lead in such a way that fulfills his purposes. Governments possess authority, but that authority is from Jesus, not from themselves. Jesus is the one that places every government and every location and every time period. But why does he do this? Two reasons. To punish evil and to promote justice. Look again at verse three. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Verse four. It is God's servant for your good. The end of verse four. It is God's servant and avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Here's what we have to understand. All of us have a longing for justice. That is to say, for things to be right in this world. That longing for justice is actually given to you by God because you are made in his image. And he is a God who longs and desires for justice. So when God institutes governments, when he places governments, he is doing so so that these governments operating within a sinful world promote justice, which is the good of God's design, and punish evil, which is what God is going to ultimately do at the end of time. So governments are representing, or they should be representing, who God is and what he is trying to accomplish in this world. Again, not exercising their own authority, but existing to punish evil, promote justice, living as an extension of God. Now, if I'm you, I'm probably wondering, okay, that sounds idealistic because have you ever heard of someone named Hitler or Stalin or Mao? But how, how was Jesus placing them in their positions? How, how is God, was he sovereign? Was he in control over those governments led by those evil individuals? Well, was God sovereign over Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel? What about Herod who reigned during the birth of Jesus? How about Pharaoh? Was God sovereign over him? What about Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who ultimately sentenced Jesus to death by crucifixion? We know the answer to those things is yes, he was sovereign, but this gets to a greater point. Jesus bestows authority. He places governments in the same way that he bestows authority to you individually and places you in the life that you're in. And you know what you have? Freedom. Human agency. You have the uh, uh, decision that you can make whether you are going to honor God or live for yourself. And government systems are no different because you want to know who runs government systems? People. You want to know what people are? Sinful. You know what they need? A savior. But this is a Christian theology of government, of politics, that Jesus places government Why? To punish evil and to promote justice. This is what governments are called to do by God. And therefore, as Christians, we can feel comfortable holding governments to this standard, even though we recognize that there are sinful men and women who operate within politics. So then, okay, that's great. So then what does that then mean for me? If that's the place for it, that's the theology of it, that's kind of the facts, if you will, around it. What does that mean for me this November? What does that mean for me today when I open up Facebook and see that person post again? Or when I have to talk to that individual at Thanksgiving this year? Well, now we need a paradigm for our politics. Because in light of what God's word has said about how governments function, what his plan for them is, We need to understand then how we operate within that function in our day, in our age, in our time period. Now, up until this point, I've walked you through Paul's words about government to give us that kind of uh, paradigm, that idea. I want to take a minute and I want to shift our attention to Jesus's words, not about government, but about people. And here's why. 
Because every political idea has a person behind it. Every piece of political legislation or rhetoric has people behind them. Therefore, if we want to understand a paradigm, how we should look at being a part of politics in our context, we have to recognize that we are not just talking about systems and ideas. We are talking about people. And what did Jesus say about people? Well, when he got into a debate, which ironically started because of a political question that he was asked, the debate shifts and he is now asked this, what is the the most important command? Like, what's the most important? If you had to nail it down to one, Jesus, what's the most important thing that we have to do as followers of you? He says this, well, the most important is listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. And what is the next thing he says? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. That's most important. But what flows from that? Look at the next line. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Now, notice what he did not say. He did not say there is no other command. He said there is no other command greater than these, loving God and loving others, which means for us, we need to love God well by understanding a uh, Christian Orthodox theology of government. We need to do that. But we need to love people well and how we are a part of politics. So in this last kind of section, I want to give us a couple of very tangible ways to view and to be a part of politics in a way that I believe represents Jesus well. But I want to do this um, under the umbrella of love. I want you to think about it like this. If we are called to love, this is the umbrella. This is the overarching reality that we are called to love God, love others. How do we do that? I think we do that by participating in politics and promoting peace within politics. So let's break those down one by one. First, participate. Now, I think that for many of us, uh, not, maybe not, not, definitely not all of us, but I think that for some of us, we might just feel like, you know what, I, I'm just not even going to get involved. <laughs> It's too chaotic, it's too divisive, um, it's too awkward with family members. I, does voting even really matter? Does my vote even do anything? I learned about the Electoral College one day. Like, what do, what do I actually say and do in this system? And isn't it all about Jesus? I mean, let's just keep the focus on the gospel and keep Jesus, like, keep the main thing the main thing. Like, we don't need to talk about politics. I understand the sentiment behind that. I think it's just a little bit short-sighted, and here's why. The primary priority that I have for my children is for them to know the gospel and to follow Jesus. But that still means that I make food for them every day and feed them. Because it would not make sense to go, I'm not going to feed my kids any food. I'm just going to teach them the gospel. How long will that last for me? It won't last very long. Because I can provide an environment where the gospel can be receptive to them. I know that apathy, especially, especially, especially in our political landscape, is tempting and alluring. But if we want to walk down the path of apathy, we need to consult people uh, like Esther, who use political processes and governments to bring glory to God and save the people of Israel. We need to talk to folks like Joseph, who was a political figure in the Egyptian government using his place and his authority for God's glory. We had talked to people like Daniel, who spoke to political leaders and changed the trajectory of even empires. I I don't think that apathy is a reality because I don't think that Paul tells us that. In light of everything he said about what the place of politics and government is, look at what he says in verse six. He goes, so for this reason, you pay taxes. Since authorities are God's servants continually intending these taxes, you didn't realize tomorrow is a day of worship for you. April 15th, pay your taxes. Pay obligations to everyone. Taxes to those you owe taxes. Tolls to owe those you owe tolls. Your son pass. It's a gospel issue. (laughs) Respect to those you owe respect and honor to those you owe honor. Do you see what Paul's saying here? In light of Jesus instituting every government and every time period to punish evil and promote justice, you know what you should do, Roman Christians? You should pay your taxes. You should pay your tolls. 
You should respect those you will respect and you should honor those who you honor. Now, how then do we participate in politics in a way that represents Jesus? Is it through memes that we find, posts on Instagram? It's through arguments that we get in, in the comments section? It's through passive aggressive comments or no, I think that actually, as a follower of Jesus in 21st century America, we have a very clear way that we participate in politics, and that's through voting. And obviously, in a message about politics, we need to talk about voting in some capacity. But the question I think we need to ask is, well, then how, how should we vote? As a follower of Jesus, how, how do I vote? Who do I vote for? I, I want to give you an acronym that I've made for myself. This is not the Bible. This is Chris. Uh, so take it with a grain of salt. This has been helpful for me and I hope it might be helpful for you when you vote. Spelled it out, V-O-T-E. When you vote, how can you do it in a way that represents Jesus? I think that there's a few things that we can do. First, no matter who the person is, the issue is, the, 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 the whatever it is, vet it through scripture. What Jesus wants you to know is found in his word Therefore, if you want to honor him and how you live, you need to know what he has said. We talked about this last week. If you want to represent Jesus well, you have to know Jesus. So you shouldn't vote for something just because you heard, saw a, a good video about it on YouTube or because you heard someone talk convincingly about it. Your first thing should be, I'm vetting this through scripture to see what God's word says about it. But then from there, you need to obtain the facts. What does this actually mean? If this piece of legislation passes, I know what, what this side is saying, what they're promoting, but what are the details about it? That bill that I'm supposed to vote yes or no on, right? What, what, what actually is within that bill if I vote yes or I vote no on it? Obtain the facts. There is an education process that we need to have and be a part of where we understand what is happening in our midst. And then from there, we can think about the implications, how is this going to affect society? How will it affect my community? How will it affect my friend's community? How will it affect my, my, my kid's school system? How will it affect you fill in the blank? What are the implications of that person in office or uh, that piece of legislation being passed? And then lastly, you need to empathize with your neighbor. As a follower of Jesus, do, you know, do we know that we don't make decisions about what is best for us. We make decisions thinking about others. That piece of legislation might benefit you in your tax bracket. How does it benefit those who are not in your tax bracket? That politician might represent you very well, but how do they represent someone in a different socioeconomic situation or of a different race or who lives in a different community? We need to empathize with our neighbors. Now, that doesn't mean we're always going to make political decisions that are the best for every single person around us, but it does not also mean then that we throw off thinking about the implications of this and what it means for someone who is different than me. Vet it through scripture, obtain the facts, think about the implications and empathize with your neighbor. And if you do that, we will solve everything. Not really. Like, is that it, right? We just vet it through scripture. We obtain the facts, think about the implications, empathize with our neighbor. Boom, we're golden. We're all going to hold hands on, I was going to say November 7th. I think that's the day that we vote, right? Hold hands, walk to the voting booth. None of us in disagreement. It's going to be great, right? I'm not that smart to come up with a situation that solves everything. And we know that. Which is why we have to understand even in light of this, Christians can agree on the truth of Jesus, but disagree on how to vote in a way that represents Jesus. As we kind of land the plane this morning, um, we need to talk about promoting peace. Because under that umbrella, we should participate in politics. That's one of the ways we love God and love our neighbors. But we cannot just participate. I think that in our political landscape, we have to make the active decision to promote peace in our political engagements. 
And I want to talk in this last section, not specifically about how we promote peace with non-Christians, but instead how we promote peace amongst our other fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Not because I don't want you to live at peace with those who are non-believers, but because if we cannot be at peace with those in the family, we'll never be at peace with those outside the family. Remember, disagreement is inevitable. Division is a choice. I'm not about to tell you not to disagree with someone. I'm going to plead that we make the conscious decision not to divide with one another. But I think all, the only way we can truly do that is that we have to wrestle with a few things before we step into a situation with someone where there is disagreement. Like, why would another Christian vote differently than me? Why would we disagree? And in, in, in light of our disagreements, which are strong, why would I still remain in unity with them? Let me just, for a few minutes, try to speak as like honestly, candidly, and pastorally as I can. Um, there are four things the Bible is incredibly clear on. The sanctity of life at every stage, racial reconciliation, a standard for sexuality and gender, and justice for the poor and marginalized. You cannot uh, honestly argue against any of those things being a priority in the library of Scripture. Okay, so in light of that, how does a Christian vote? Well, obviously, then maybe a true Christian would vote leaning left. I mean, the, the left promote policies and rhetoric that lift up the poor and the marginalized, they advocate for racial reconciliation. They seem to be the first that speak out in moments of racial outrage in our country. But what else do they advocate for? The left turns the life of a baby in the womb into a human rights issue, a women's rights issue, not a human life issue. The left redefines marriage they separate gender and sex, saying one is a biological reality, the other is a social construct, opening up a Pandora's box of implications that we are all seeing play out in front of us every single day. Okay, well then, obviously then a Christian would vote leaning right politically, right? The right holds a traditional view of family and their policies and in their rhetoric. They promote the marriage between one man and one woman. There are only two genders, male and female. They also protect the life in the womb. Republican politicians have gone so far as to overturn Roe v. Wade, making abortion illegal in our country. What about Republican policies, though, for the poor? And the marginalized, why does it seem as though the right cares more about making the rich richer and the poor poor? And whenever there is racial strife in our country, why does it feel like Republicans are always the ones who don't want to have conversations with people of color? Don't want to talk about that there might still be racial injustices in our midst. Take a deep breath. I know that as I'm bringing those examples up, you are having an internal debate with me. Deep breath. That's because these things are complicated, they're nuanced, and they're emotionally charged. Politics are not just politics. Politics are personal because they are personal reflection of who we are and what we hold to be true and false. And yet you and I live in a country that wants us to believe that these issues can be solved in the comment section on Facebook. I'm sure if we had a mic that we passed around the room, gave everybody a moment to say, hey, you have a moment to talk and represent your political party, your political persuasions. I'm sure all of us would have this moment and you could sell me and critique me on how I just misrepresented your political party, how I just misrepresented your opposing political party. Well, you minimize what they actually do. Their policies don't help the poor. They just put them in control of the government. They, they don't actually care about traditional marriage. Look at the scandals that are with their politicians. Look at their personal lives. Yes, I probably did misrepresent your political party or the political party you disagreed with. But here's my question. What is upsetting us more right now? 
that we're misrepresenting political parties or that we are too often misrepresenting Jesus in our politics. That is where this becomes an issue. And that is where we have to change our political paradigm. I'm not telling you not to disagree with somebody. I'm telling you, you can make the conscious decision to be an individual who will promote peace with someone and remain unified. But we will never be able to do that if our view of politics is skewed, because I think this is how too many of us operate right here. This is how it works for us. We start with our politics, and then our politics inform our morality, and then our morality informs our identity. Okay, so when that happens, here's what ultimately becomes a reality for us. Whoever is in this first chair becomes the God that we worship because it's the first thing coming in our life. That is the idol that sits on the throne of our life because that is the filter we run everything through. Well, what does my party say about this? What is their stance on that? Oh, what does this talking head say about this issue or that issue? Our politics affect our morality. And so it shouldn't surprise us that when it comes to morality, we are divided, we are angry, we are hostile, we are unkind and mean to one another because our politics are driving that. When was the last time a politician stood up and said, you know what would be really good this election season? Everyone to get along. The few that do that get made fun of. No, that doesn't work. Because it puts us on a trajectory of idolatry. I love what one pastor said, talking about our political situation here in America, about our parties. He says, as a products of human invention, political parties inevitably have idolatrous trajectories and they trend towards positions that do not honor or reflect God's character. No human political party has a monopoly on justice. You know who has a monopoly on justice? Jesus. No, we, we don't let our politics inform our morality, which informs our identity. It's the other way around. Our identity comes first. And what did we talk about last week? If you are an ambassador, what is your identity and who is it in? Jesus. That affects your morality. With your identity in Christ, you will still disagree with people and even other Christians because of the complicated nature of our political landscape, which by the way, I'll just say one more thing about that. Would it, is it not the scheme of the enemy that he would take four things that the Bible is very clear on and split them across party lines? Let's not be deceived. He does not want the church to be unified. He wants division. He does not want us to find our identity in Christ. But if we do, that will affect our morality, how we treat people, how we live, how we operate, how we then vote. I just want you to see, I can't, I know, I know you probably still have a million questions and I can't answer every single one. I just want you to see how your brother and sister in Christ might vote differently than you this year and why they might be doing it because they think that's the best way they can represent Jesus. Notice what I'm again not saying. I'm not saying then that we hold hands and just say, well, we don't need to disagree or talk about our disagreements. There's actually something edifying about disagreeing with a Christian brother and sister in a godly way. Saying, hey, I know you voted that way. I don't agree with that. I think that if you really care about life, here's the best way we can vote. Here's the best thing that we can advocate for. That's different than posting passive aggressive things about people on Instagram, writing somebody off because you don't want to have the conversation. I'm not saying don't disagree. I'm saying don't divide. Because Christians can agree on the truth of Jesus and yet disagree on how to vote in a way that represents him. So we need to maybe wrestle with how could someone disagree with me who follows Jesus? But then we have a bigger thing to wrestle with, and that's this. Why should I stay unified with them? Why should I remain in unity with them, in relationship with them? In a very simple way, I'll tell you why. Because the world is watching. The night before Jesus was crucified, he's praying. And this prayer is recorded, and I want to note something that it says in John chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. Jesus says this about his disciples, his followers. I have given them the glory you gave me, 
so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is talking about the unity in the Trinity being what we see in the church, that we are just as unified. And then he says this, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying the perfect unity of the church will be a testament that Jesus is who he says he is and that he came to save this world. Why should you remain unified with your Christian brothers and sisters? Because the world is watching. And I think we have given the world too many reasons not to follow Jesus because of our interactions with one another when it comes to politics. About a year ago, JJ and I were having a conversation about sermon series this year, and um, we thought you said, you know, it's, it's an election year. Um, and we thought back to 2020. We were not serving together. We were different churches. What we saw happen in this church and the church I was a part of, back to 2016, we can go back to every election year. And I think we get to election years and we sit down and we go, we go, brace ourselves. Everyone's going to hate each other this year. We'll circle back midway through June next year and we'll all be friends again. <laughs> they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's insanity. Letting your politics inform how you treat people. Letting the 24-hour news cycle and things on social media and angry interactions with friends be the things that lead you and how you will now interact in politics this year. What would be different for us? Step out. To disagree with one another, but to not divide with one another. To have good conversations with one another. To tell people lovingly, I think you're dead wrong. But in doing so, what a testament, what a testament to the world. What a witness to this world. People who disagree with one another politically, living in friendship, going to dinner together, having real conversations that are not about putting you down and making fun of you and telling you how terrible of a person you are. What a witness for Jesus that could be. What a place we could play in the advancement of God's kingdom. This political season could be an obstacle. What if it was an opportunity? What if people could look at STF and go, you know what? They don't all get along all the time. They don't always agree, but man, they are unified. How are they still friends? How are they still together? We'll tell you why. Because we have been bought with a price. The punishment that was ours was taken on by Jesus. And therefore, we can be people who represent him first and foremost. We have to make that decision, though. As the band comes back out, and we just take a moment to close, I was reminded this week as um, just praying through this message and thinking through um, just really what the Lord would want to say to our church. Um, I have two coins that are in my office. Um, one coin is from around the time uh, that Jesus is on this earth. And on that coin, it's from the Roman government. It's a Roman coin and it has an image of the emperor at that time. I have another coin from about 300 years later and on that coin is an image of Jesus. I ask the question, how does the Roman government go from emperors on their coins to Jesus on their coins? And if you look at the history of the Roman government, it's not because a bunch of Christians entered into political influence. In fact, those 300 years were probably some of the hardest years to ever be a Christian here on earth. But you want to know what happened? The gospel advanced and the kingdom of God moved on because the gates of hell will not prevail against Jesus. We all want to see our world different. We all want to see our world more like Christ. We should participate in politics, but that's not where our hope is. It's in the one who hung on a cross for us, died and rose again. Will we stand out? Will we step out? Or will we just fall in line and allow ourselves to fall with the world around us? I pray that we would be different, that we'd represent Jesus well this political season. 
So Father, we just ask that you would take these words, make them clear in our hearts. Speak to us, we ask. We want our foundation to be on you, Jesus. We want to build our lives on you, Christ. I pray you would help us to do that and that our hope would not wax and wane based on who is in office, but that our hope would be solid because it is seated at the right hand of the Father. And nothing can prevail against your church, Jesus. I pray now as we worship, we would remember that, be reminded of that, we pray in your name, Jesus. Let's stand together and let's sing one last time.